Hello everyone, I'm Hannah Fisher, your Region 1 Secretary. And I'm Bob Blanchard, your Region 1 Sentinel. Today, me and Bob are going to be talking to you guys about digital citizenship. Bob, what is digital citizenship? Digital citizenship can be defined as the norms of appropriate, responsible behavior with regard to technology use. Hannah, what is the importance of digital citizenship? Well, there are nine different elements to digital citizenship, and we're going to be explaining those for you guys today. The first one is digital access. Technology users need to be aware that not everyone has those same opportunities that you do when it comes to technology. Part of digital citizenship is working towards the digital rights and supporting all over electronic access to everyone. It's really important to understand that just because you can access someone easily on the internet doesn't mean that access will always be there. But for those that do have the digital access, you can do a lot of stuff, such as digital commerce. Digital commerce can be defined as the electronic buying and selling of goods. Technology users need to understand that a large share of market economy is being done electronically. Legitimate and legal exchanges are occurring, but the buyer or seller needs to be aware of the issues associated with it. Users need to learn about how to be effective consumers in a new digital economy. Hannah, what are some things about digital communication? Well, digital communication is the electronic exchange of information. One of the most significant changes with the digital revolution is a person's ability to communicate with other people. Throughout the years, we've noticed that it's a lot more easy to communicate digitally rather than personally. Um, in the 21st century, communica communication options have exploded for a wide variety of choices, such as email, cell phones, instant messaging, which can come with digital literacy, which we'll talk about later. The expanding digital community communication options have changed everything. People are able to communicate with constant communication with anyone and everyone. Now that everyone has the ability to communicate and collaborate with anyone from any time, this can bring some wishy-washy areas because due to communication, you aren't seen as in person and it can make it a lot easier to use it broadly. Through digital communication, we have to have a general understanding of digital literacy. Bob, what is digital literacy? Digital literacy is the process of teaching and learning about technology and the use of technology. If there's one thing that I've seen from this pandemic is how quickly us students can adopt new technologies. We've learned how to use Zoom, Google Classroom, and even just e-learning in general. This is going to prepare our generation better than ever for the workplace that we're going to enter. Next up, we're going to be talking about digital etiquette. Hannah? Digital etiquette is electronic standards of conducting and proceeding through things. Technology users often see this area as one of their most pressing problems when dealing with technology. We recognize that inappropriate behavior when we see it is not okay, but before people use technology, they often don't learn the appropriate conduct or the etiquette to use technology. Many people feel uncomfortable talking to others about their digital etiquette. Most rules and regulations are created so that technology can be simply banned or the inappropriate use can just be stopped right then and there. But that's not enough. We need to create rules and policies and we have to teach everyone how to be a responsible citizen when conducting with digital etiquette. This can lead into the digital law. Bob, what is digital law? Digital law is defined as the electronic responsibility for actions and deeds. Digital law deals with the ethics of technology within a society. Unethical use manifests itself into a form of theft and even crime. Ethical use manifests itself into a form of abiding by the laws of society. Users need to understand that stealing or causing damage to other people's work, identity, or property online is a crime. There are certain rules of society that users need to be aware of today. These laws apply to anyone who works or plays online. Hacking into others' information, downloading illegal music, plagiarizing, creating destructive viruses, or even just sending spam is unethical and sometimes even illegal. Hannah, what's up next? Well, we need to talk about our digital rights and our responsibilities. These freedoms are extended to everyone in the digital world. Just as the American Constitution, where there is a Bill of Rights, there's a basic set of rights and examples extended to every digital citizen. We all have the right to privacy, freedom of speech, and every other basic right, basic rights. We need to understand that even though we have freedom of speech, we still have to be responsible with what we are posting and what we are saying. Because just because you have the freedom of speech doesn't mean you have the freedom to say whatever you want. Things can be harmful to others and you need to be mindful of that. You must, users must define technology and the appropriate manner in which to use it. 
in a digital society, we have to work together because there are so many great areas that we don't know that we have to define ourselves. This can tie in with our health and wellness. Bob, what do you have to say about that? Digital health and wellness is the physical and psychological well-being in the digital technology world. Beyond the physical issues are those of the psychological issues that are becoming more prevalent, such as internet addiction. Users need to be taught that there are inherent dangers of technology. Digital citizenship includes a culture where technology users are taught how to protect themselves through education and training. Hannah, what is the last element of digital citizenship? Well, our last element is digital security or your self-protection. You need to take electronic precautions to guarantee your safety on the internet. In any society, there's individuals who steal, deface, or disrupt other people. The same is true for the digital community. It's not enough just to trust other members in the community for our own safety. In our own homes, we put locks on our doors and we put fire alarms in our houses to provide at least some level of protection. The same must be true for our digital security. We need to have virus protections, you need to have backups of your data, and have a surge control of our equipment. As responsible citizens, we must protect our information from outside sources that might cause the disruption or any harm. All right, me and Bob have a few tips on how to keep your online presence safe. The first tip is using reputable websites. Hannah, if you know me, you know I'm a bit of a shopaholic. And one thing that I have learned is to spend my money on only safe websites, such as Amazon, Walmart.com, or Google. One thing that I have ordered off of is a website called Wish.com. It's based in China. I don't know if you have any experience with this. Yeah, it can be pretty sketchy putting your online information on not only a website you're not familiar with, but a website that other people aren't familiar with. Another issue I ran into with Wish was when I would order things, the packages wouldn't arrive for about two months and it wouldn't even be the things I ordered. So as long as you order from reputable websites, you should have a good experience. Hannah, what do you say about using your credit card only? Well, especially with those sites that you aren't used to, you're putting all of your information on your sites, your credit card information, your birthday, your name, your address. That can be really scary to put online, especially if these companies are selling your information to other, other companies, or even if they're just keeping it to send you spam, to possibly send you the wrong stuff. You don't want your information with people that you can't trust, especially your money, your address, your name, things that they can steal and commit identity thought, identity fraud. Um, they could spend your credit card on other websites and there's not much you can do to get that back. So you have to be safe with what info you're using and where you're putting that information. Another piece of internet safety is being smart on what we post. I use a lot of social media platforms, as we all do, such as Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook. But one thing, one rule of thumb I live by is, if I have to think twice about what I'm going to post, I just don't post it. This can lead to a lot of consequences if you post bad things. Mm -hmm. um, it can lead to professional consequences, consequences in the FFA, consequences at school, and even just at home. Thinking as FFA members, us as officers, we are representing FFA as an organization. We are faces of FFA and we need to be careful with what we're saying. The same goes for chapter officers or even just members. You know, this year we've seen what can happen if you are not posting appropriately, if you're not thinking about what you're saying. If you wouldn't want your grandma to see it, then we don't want to see it. Another important thing I have to add is about password protection. I've seen a lot of my friends and their Instagram accounts and their Facebook accounts get hacked by them not having a strong password. A strong password should be something that nobody else knows. You shouldn't write down your passwords, you should not share them with anyone, you should just keep them in your head so that nobody can hack into your account and post things that you don't believe in. Hannah, do you have anything else to add? I think you definitely shouldn't have your name in your password, your birthday in your password, any information that anyone can easily access as your password, and you shouldn't set your password for multiple accounts. It shouldn't be the same password for every account. While that might be easy to remember, it's extremely easy for someone just to go through all of your accounts and enter that one password. Um, while thinking about that, it's also important what information you share and who you're sharing it with. Strangers on the internet are all over. You don't know everyone as well as you think, and people can lie about who they are, and they could easily steal your information that way by making you think that you're best friends and it's secretly an old guy in the basement and now he has all of your information. 
Uh, you have to be extremely conscious with who you're talking to, what information you're sharing with that person, and you definitely shouldn't meet up with them. No, that's the biggest thing, is not meeting up with strangers that we meet on the internet. Yeah. Because we don't know who's on the other side of that screen. So, last, I just want to thank everyone for attending our session today, and we hope you learned something about being a better digital citizen. Anything else, Hannah? Um, if you guys have any questions, you can talk to any of us region officers. We will be having an online live talk session with you guys, and we hope to hear from you guys and how you felt about all of this, and just answer any questions you have. Yeah, thanks for attending. Networking. Communication throughout your chapter. As we all come into this school year, many things will be quite different as before. So Katie and I will be explaining to you how to start a conversation with newer members as this year progresses. The main thing we will be talking about today is conversation stack, which associates conversation topics with a stack of images. It allows you to strike efficient conversations with strangers while avoiding awkward silence. The stack on the next few slides work best in networking events with a focus on work or business events. This year may be different with more virtual events. You might not get a lot of face-to-face -face conversations, but this method of communication will help you over text call in future years. We will begin with the nameplate. Begin by introducing yourself. Hi, my name is blank. What's your name? Once a person says their name, repeat it back. Nice to meet you, blank. The more you repeat their name in the conversation, the more you'll remember it when the conversation is over. Introducing yourself to a newer person can be hard sometimes, but this is what starts a new conversation and gets many new members to feel welcomed instead of just there as another number or member to your chapter. We want new members to feel as if they are wanted there, not needed there. Second is the house of your dreams. On top of the nameplate, there's the house of your dreams. A couple questions you can ask are, where are you from? How long have you lived here? Keep conversations going by asking what they like about here, living there, and if they have always lived there. Keep it open-ended questions. Asking people where they're from can help you know their backgrounds and things they might be interested in. Next is your family. On top of the house is a family. As you get off the topic of where you live, move on to family. Questions to ask are, do you still live near your family? Do you have any pets or siblings? If so, what are their names? Tip, periodically bring up facts about yourself so the other person does not feel like they are being interviewed. Asking about family will help members to get to explain who they are Getting to know about the family also helps you get to know if that member has siblings who may have been an FFA and who may have been this new member's influence to join the organization. Next is the worker's glove. Someone in your family is wearing the worker's glove, which represents what you do for work. Things you can ask are, are you a student? If so, what school do you attend? Where do you work? Do you like what you do? How long have you been working there? Tip, make sure to continue bringing what you do into the conversation and continue to use their name. Knowing what their family does for a living might teach you a little, about, a little bit about what they want to do. Ask if they have a summer job and mention supervised egg experiences to them. Explain it to them what it is. Pink jet. The person in the family wearing the glove is holding on to a pink jet. This symbolizes travel. Questions to ask. Have you traveled? Where have you been? Would you recommend the place to others? If you are interested in going to a similar place, ask them what they did while they were there. Getting to know where a member has been will get you to understand a little bit more as to what they may like for different opportunities in FFA, like national or state conventions. Next on the stack is the tennis racket propellers. Instead of regular propellers, this jet has tennis rackets as propellers, which re represents their hobbies. Questions to ask are, are you interested in anything? What are some of your hobbies? Do you play any sports? Do you have a favorite sports team? What else do you do in your free time? Tip, 
If you have a similar hobby to them, try to relate to them so that they know that you're still interested. Knowing what they like to do can help you find a CDE or LED that might help them might find interesting. The goalpost. On the wing of the jet is a goalpost. This symbolizes goals and aspirations. Question to ask. What is your dream job? What is one of your most favorite personal goals? What do you aspire to do? Tip. Make sure to encourage them to pursue their goals and aspirations, especially if they seem scared about it. Asking a new member for their goals will help them to find an older student who might just be able to help them pursue these goals. Having that accountability will make them feel very good about their goals and make them want to achieve these goals in the near future if they can. Last but not least is the light bulb. Inside the gold post is a light bulb that symbolizes a spark or interest in a topic. Questions to ask are, you seem to be very interested in this topic, tell me more. If you are not interested in this topic, never bring down their opinions, especially if it's something they love. When you're talking to a younger member and you see that they love talking about something, encourage them to tell you more about it so you make them feel more involved. Here is a picture of the full conversation stack. Make sure to have a positive attitude and be respectful while conversating with a new person. Know that when you are talking to a new person, everything you say towards what they do will affect them for a long time. Know what to say when people are there and not there. To the right, we have the picture. The name plate being introductions, house, on top of the nameplate being where you live or where you are from, the family and the house being how many people that may be in the family, the worker's glove being what people do for work or school, the jet being where they have traveled, the racket propellers being hobbies or how you spend your free time, the goalposts on top of the jet being goals and aspirations, and the light inside the goalpost being a spark in a person's interest. With the full stack, you have a full conversation right there. Using this can help you inside and outside of FFA and can definitely help you in the future. This won't only be a high school thing. This can also help you as you graduate and get a job. Other community networking. Examples of ways to reach out to your community are writing thank you cards to sponsors and other advisors in your life. Make sure sure to correspond with others for ideas and or thoughts. Know how to act when the situation may be professional or not. Many younger members are looking up to you and you are their role model. So make a positive impact on what on them. What you do or say affects what they say or do. Conversation stacking is what could get new members, new sponsors and more involvement. Using these many ways to Communicate will make not only others feel good, but it also makes you proud of what you have accomplished. These won't only make you help you now, but they will help you for future events as well as interviews, meetings, new colleagues, and more. Thank you for tuning in to networking slash communication. Next up, we have Caden and Wyatt with agenda making, so tune in. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Katie and I. We are always willing to help. Good morning, everyone. Region 1 President Wyatt Halverson from the Thief River Falls FFA chapter here. Today, we're going to be looking at the building an agenda presentation. Knowing how to build an agenda can be such a useful skill to you as an officer and a politically active person in the future, which I hope all of you become. Let's hop right into this presentation made by myself, and region reporter Caden Johnson. Today, we're going to talk about one of the most useful skills that you as a chapter officer can master. Without an agenda, your meeting will not get run smoothly. The graphic on the right is just a little bit of a show on what your agenda can look like, but doesn't need to. You're going to start out with your title. So, for example, the title of this meeting would be Region 1 RLC, our group is Region 1 FFA. An example on a chapter level would be 
blank chapter meeting and blank chapter. This applies to any meeting you're having. So right now, the title of our meeting would be the Region 1 RLC agenda making video meeting. And our group would be the Region 1 FFA. Uh, in my case, a chapter meeting would be the Thief River Falls chapter meeting. And the group would be the Thief River Falls FFA. Does that make sense? You can also use it in the case of a committee. So the title would be, in an example that uh, works for me, the Thief River Falls fundraising committee meeting. And your group would be the Thief River Falls fundraising committee. The next part is going to be the date and time, which is pretty self-explanatory. It's just the date and the time. Next on the agenda is the call to order. Usually the chair will call the meeting to order, and at this time is when you can take your attendance in collaboration with the secretary, making sure that every member and guest is accounted for. Directly following the call to order is when you're going to take a look at your secretary's report. The chair will ask the secretary for it, and then you as a quorum can read and approve it. Directly following the secretary's report, we get to look at the treasurer's report. The same thing goes for the treasurer's report. Everyone reads it and approves it, remembering to say, file subject to audit. After you fully read and approve all of the minutes for the previous meeting, including the treasurer's report, you can move into the officer reports and the committee reports and do the same. Right after that, you can get into your business. You start with the old business, and that's anything that's been laid on the table from a previous meeting or something that needs to be brought up again. Right after the old business is the new business, and this is everything that is recent and relevant that hasn't been discussed yet. This is where you can introduce new topics that you think will benefit your chapter. Last and possibly the most important part of your agenda is adjourning. Adjourning closes off the meeting and lets everyone know that your agenda is finished. Thank you so much for listening. And if you guys have any questions, please feel free to contact us because we are resources for you. And finally, thank you guys so much for watching again. If you ever have any questions about leadership or parliamentary procedure or agenda making, feel very, very free to contact myself or Caden uh, with the information that was just a hop, skip, and a jump that way or on any of our personal emails or our region email. We want to be resources for you and we want to get to know you guys, so feel very free to reach out. Last, all of this information was attained from Robert's Rules of Orders slash Agenda website. So if you want a much more in-depth uh, explanation, head over there and you should find everything that your little heart desires. Thank you guys for watching so much. 